My name is Matt Gibson and uh, welcome to the webinar How to Work with Influencers for Maximum Impact and Minimum Cost. Uh, this webinar was brought to you by the Pacific Asia Travel Association in partnership with the Professional Travel Bloggers Association. Um, so today we're going to talk about some of the basics when you're working with influencers. Uh, just sort of like a little bit of background about what influencer marketing is and why it's really important to your business, especially uh, in the travel industry. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the basics about uh, how different influencers work, why some influencers are different from others, um, how to identify a quality influencer, and then we're going to talk about the major pain points that are faced by businesses when they're first trying to work with influencers in travel. Uh, and the major hurdles that they face, and then some of the common ways that people overcome those hurdles, and some of the sort of uh, standard models that some people have been using to work with influencers, the most common ways they've been working with them. So that by the end of this webinar, uh, you should have a good idea about the first steps you can take towards working with influencers. Now, this talk is not for somebody who has been spending a lot of time already running influencer campaigns. Uh, if you've run several influencer campaigns in the past and you're happy with what you've with the results you've got, there's a good chance that this talk will not be providing you with a lot of new information. This talk is aimed at people who are really interested in working with influencers. They might have dabbled in it once or twice, or they've been talking about it a lot, but they're not sure how to take the next steps. Those are the kind of people who this webinar is made for. Uh, so to start off, uh, just a little bit about myself. My name is Matt Gibson. Uh, I've been a travel blogger for about, coming up on nine years now. So I was one of the earlier travel bloggers to start. Uh, my blog has won a few awards, um, and I've been doing it for a long time, so I'm very well versed in the travel blogging community. Uh, I know a lot about who is around, who all the different influencers are, and uh, just because of that experience, I have a really strong understanding of the uh, industry best practices. Uh, now, I'm also the president of the Professional Travel Bloggers Association. The Professional Travel Bloggers Association is a nonprofit association that's dedicated to helping travel influencers and travel industry to work together better and more effectively by providing them with uh, networking opportunities, providing them with education, such as uh, this webinar, and trying to help create uh, industry wide best practices to take a lot of the guesswork out of this because. Being sort of a new form of marketing, the industry standards still haven't really been established yet, and we find that that's a major problem people face, is uh, not knowing what they should expect and how much they should be paying for it, um, and we're trying to help establish those kinds of things. So that's part of why I feel uh, it's really important to get this message out and help start to educate people about how they can work better with influencers. Uh, the last thing is that I'm also the CEO of a company called Expat Media based in Hong Kong that specializes in uh, travel industry and travel industry influencer marketing. So for those reasons, all of those reasons, I'm uh, fairly knowledgeable in this. I wouldn't say I'm the most knowledgeable person on earth. There are some people who have been out there doing this for longer than I have, uh, but I definitely have a, a pretty high level of understanding. So first, let's start with why we are making this video right now. We're creating this video specifically for you right now because uh, travel, Padis Travel Mart is coming up in Indonesia. Now, the Pacific Asia Travel Association and the Professional Travel Bloggers Association have partnered in order to help uh, raise the level of awareness of influencer marketing at the Pacific Asia Travel Association's events. And in order to do that, we do some talks, we hold some seminars, and we also bring select bloggers to those uh, events so that any interested industry people who are either looking for travel, travel bloggers or travel influencers to work with 
uh, or people who are just interested in learning more and want to sit down and get to know us, we bring about 15 or 20 bloggers to each event. Uh, we set up a blogger lounge where we are there, just there and available. You can make appointments to talk with us. You can come sit down and we can talk about doing business together or we can just answer your questions. Uh, we're just kind of there for that. So we're just kind of trying to uh, help raise the uh, raise the information level among industry of how our business works and hopefully to meet some people that we can do business with as well. So we're sending this out now in order to help prepare people and give them an idea of what they might want to talk with us about if they want to come meet us at uh, Pada Travel Mart September 7th to 9th in uh, Jakarta, Indonesia. That said, let's get on with the educational part. So the first thing that I want to talk about is just a very simple, what is an influencer? So a while ago, we started our association, the Professional Travel Bloggers Association. And things have changed in technology so fast that our own name is already out of date. We started out under the assumption that bloggers were the most, and at that time they were probably the most important type of influencer. Bloggers were around before Facebook and before Instagram. We had bloggers and bloggers were building their audiences. So we named ourselves the Professional Travel Bloggers Association, but it's no longer really, blogger is no longer really a relevant term because Yes, a person who has a blog is a blogger. My main uh, method of reaching my audience is through my blog. But people like myself and other bloggers also have numerous other distribution methods for our content or different platforms that we use. So we will probably, almost all of us, you'll find us on Twitter. Uh, almost everyone's going to have a Facebook page. We all have... Instagram accounts, a lot of people are starting to Snapchat more and more and more. Uh, most people have a Pinterest account. So what we're finding is that an influencer, or what used to be known as a blogger, is now a person who's distributing content on several different platforms. And the content is usually um, made specifically for that platform. So one blogger might have a good blog with a large audience, whereas another blogger might have a smaller blog, but a huge Facebook audience that's very engaged, or another might have a specifically a, a really large Instagram following and Snapchat following while their blog audience is smaller. So things are getting a bit more complex when you start talking about working with bloggers or working with influencers. Um, and it makes it simpler in some ways, and it makes it more comp complicated in some ways. In some ways, it's great because if you know what platform you want uh, to reach people on for a specific reason, then you have a lot more options, and it's a lot easier to find those people. It's more complex if you're not sure about why you would want to use each specific platform, and that can be a little bit confusing for people. Um, but at the beginning, I really just encourage people to think about it as this. A blog is one way of creating a certain kind of content and then distributing it to an audience. It's just one method of distribution, right? Blogs are usually going to be pictures and words, sometimes some videos. But that's just one way of getting this content that I've created about a topic and getting it out to my audience who I want to see it. Okay, uh, Instagram is just another content distribution platform. It's just a different way of reaching my audience with content, in this case, pictures. Uh, in YouTube, the distribution channel is for video. Um, but all they really are are different ways to reach the audience. So we really just need to start thinking about them in those terms. and what value it has for you to have a video on YouTube versus a picture on Instagram uh, versus written words on a blog. You know, one of those is probably going to be better suited to your message or to the audience you're trying to reach than one of the other ones. Uh, so that being said, we're not really going to talk about bloggers much anymore. 
even though I'm the president of the Professional Travel Bloggers Association, we should just think about these people as influencers who use various uh, platforms to distribute content to audiences. That's really going to be the most useful way to consider these people moving forwards. Um, now, why is influencer marketing important to you and important to your business? Now, if you've been reading marketing literature for the past couple of years, I'm sure you've read a lot about influencer marketing. Um, the reason is that Time and time again, studies have shown that the value that you get from influencer marketing, dollar for dollar, is just much greater than other marketing channels. Um, I myself have done some comparisons where I compared magazine advertising rates to um, the value of a blog post that I created for a sponsor based on the amount of time people spent looking at the blog post as compared to the amount of time people would have spent looking at an advertisement in a magazine. Um, you can break that down to how many seconds consumers are likely to see this ad in a magazine. And that divided by the cost of the ad was, I believe, about two cents per second. It was a major American travel magazine. And when you applied that price to the blog post that I created for this uh, client of mine, um, a magazine ad where the client would have been paying uh, $50,000 for, they were going to receive a similar amount of exposure for around four to $5,000 um, through the blog. And many studies have shown this. I don't want to go too much into it. It's been shown time and time again that for the amount of attention you get from your target consumers uh, on your content, travel influencer influencer marketing just tends to be a much more cost-effective way to go. Um, and that's why it's been such a big buzzword in, in travel and in marketing in general. And that's why uh, we want to help teach you a bit more about how to get started. So now in this talk, there's sort of three main types of organizations that are going to be interested in working with influencers. <clears throat> there, there are going to be more, but in travel, there's going to be three main, uh, main people. There will be destination marketing organizations, like a tourism board or a membership-funded DMO. Uh, there are going to be hotels, and then there are going to be tour companies that uh, are looking for inbound tourists. Now, destination marketing organizations are slightly different than the other two in that they have the ability to uh, usually work with airlines to fly in people and choose influencers that they want from abroad and actually bring them to the country. Um, this isn't going to directly address all of the issues that are associated with that kind of a program because I think there's a lot more people in the audience today probably who are from tour companies looking for inbound uh, tourists and hotels who are looking for exposure to inbound tourists. I think they're going to make up the bulk of the market, so I'm going to focus on the problems faced by them. They're not totally different from those faced by DMOs. They're just slightly different. Um, so the first problem that a hotel or a tour company based in Destination X is that they don't have the ability to, like a DMO, actually go out and choose a blogger from another country or an influencer from another country and fly them into the country, into the destination to uh, try out their product. Um, that is kind of a, that's a big limitation. So let's say, for example, we're talking about uh, there's a hotel in Hong Kong that would like to find influencers that are coming to Hong Kong. And they really want to work with influencers in Hong Kong. The same situation applies to a local tour company. Most often you're going to find that first, um, these are going to be small to medium sized companies. Sometimes they're larger chains uh, who will have a larger marketing department. But often a hotel will say have one marketing person working in their department or a tour company will. In the case of a larger chain, it's still not going to get much bigger. They'll have a few people in the marketing department that have a lot of duties on their plate, and one of them is dealing with influencers. Now, in this situation, the hotel or the tour company is totally passive. 
um, they have to just kind of wait and see what influencers happen to come to visit that country or are visiting their destination and reach out to them and pitch them to stay at their hotel or to go on a tour with their tour company. And that is a, that's a real barrier for the marketer in that they're limited in the influencers they can work with only to those who are actively showing up in the destination and then out of all the other places that they could approach are approaching their specific hotel or their tour company. Super limiting. Um, so there are some ways to deal with that. First, if you want to really ramp up your influencer marketing, there is no way to find out which bloggers are going to be visiting your destination reliably. A lot of people have tried to build platforms that would help to track where bloggers are and where they are going, but nobody has been able to do it very successfully and very reliably. So the only other option is to try and tell as many influencers as possible that you are in Destination X and you are willing to work with influencers so that if they come to that destination, they should contact you. At least this way you can increase the number of people who are approaching you and therefore increase your ability to pick uh, the most effective or the best ones to work with. So, uh, there are a few ways you can do this. First, there are several travel blogger groups on Facebook. Facebook is a uh, huge hub for travel influencers. There are several groups of thousands plus people where they are actually talking about their work, they're talking about their travels, and they would be happy to hear from industry people who are interested in uh, working with them. One barrier you'll find is that some will not allow in, some of the groups will be restricted to travel bloggers only and will not allow in industry people. But you'll also find that some do allow in industry people. So in order to get your message out, you would either want to personally sign up for those groups yourselves, the one that you are, the ones that you can get into, or you would want to work with a travel blogger or uh, influencer who is already in the groups to help spread your message to the blogging community. Of course, the Professional Travel Bloggers Association also is a really good way to do this, um, not only through our Facebook group, but through our newsletter. And we also have a page for our members, our travel blogger members, where our industry members can post a standing offer for our blogger members. So an industry person could say, you know, hey, if you're going to be in uh, Brussels, we have a hotel in Brussels, we'd love you to see any influencer comes through. We would be happy to provide two nights uh, B&B for you in exchange for a mention in a blog post that you write about Brussels or something like that. Um, and that page is always there for them to check to find opportunities. So I guess the first step you're going to want is just sort of like a travel influencer community PR. You want to get your message out into the travel influencer community so that they know that you are available to work with them and where you are. Okay. The second problem that most, um, most companies face when they're working with influencers is that they're working with us, you know, limited resources. A marketing department is always running at full speed because you can never really do enough marketing. So you're talking about employees who have a lot on their tape, they have a lot on their plate. They're looking at ad buys. They're looking at partnerships. They're looking at all sorts of things. And influencers is a very small part of their job. So when it comes to figuring out how to vet an influencer to see if they're quality or not. Um, it's probably a skill that they haven't had time to develop properly. Now, in addressing all of these pain points, really my first suggestion is always going to be if you have the budget for it, outsource it to somebody who does it for a living because it's just too intricate uh, and too constantly changing of a job for somebody to do it part-time in your office and be really exceptionally good at it. 
Um, so that said, vetting is usually a problem. It requires a bit of technical understanding of different metrics that are used to gauge websites uh, and Instagram and uh, what the kind of uh, engagement, a normal engagement ratio is on Instagram, for example. Um, it takes quite a lot of uh, different, just different skills and knowledge that change from platform to platform that can only really be acquired by staying constantly up to date with how things are changing. Uh, for example, Instagram engagement just fell basically across the board for everyone very recently. Now, I was looking at a client's Instagram account, and he had he had outsourced his Instagram to somebody else. And I just looked at the number of followers he had and the number of likes that he was getting on average on a photo, and it just seemed out of whack to me. So I compared his account with some of the most successful accounts on Instagram. The most successful accounts on Instagram were getting maybe, like at, way at the top, 5% engagement. Um, but generally, three was a re three percent engagement was really good, um, and his account was getting sixteen percent engagement. So that immediately told me that his something was wrong with the people he was outsourcing to. They were probably doing something shady. So, and I just use this as an example to say, it just takes this sort of in depth day to day understanding to see that. I just noticed that something was wrong with what was going on with his account and was able to use the know what the tools were to look into it real fast and in 10 minutes we figured out that he was probably working with shady people um, and, but there's no way to really know that unless you're very familiar with Instagram and how it's been changing on a day-to-day -day basis. So you want somebody who can vet your influencers to make sure that they're not doing anything weird or shady or uh, buying followers or buying traffic or anything like that. And that's not something that's easy to do in-house. That being said, I'm going to run you through a few tools here that I like to use if I'm vetting somebody. It's just a very fast way uh, to look through everything just to kind of uh, hit all the check boxes, make sure everything sort of seems to add up. Um, it's by no means the thoroughest way to do it, but uh, it's what I like to do for a quick check. So I'll show you what I do. Okay, so uh, just to give you an example of vetting a website, I'm going to run you through what I would do if I was looking at my own blog as somebody I was considering working with. Um, so I'm just going to run you through a few steps and a few tools that I use to try and make sure that uh, First, it's somebody who I probably want to work with to make sure that they have a solid following that's going to benefit me and to ensure that they're uh, going to behave in a business-like way most likely and that dealing with them is going to be as uh, easy as possible. So, I mean, first thing I'll do is I'll just take a quick look at the site. Um, you're probably going to want to read a few of their blog posts, read some of the recent blog posts, see what they've been up to, look at the general look of the site. I always like to see uh, these kinds of things, these social, we call this social credibility. It shows that they have uh, been around for a while, they may have been mentioned or quoted in or referenced by some of these publications. I've been referenced by, by a bunch of them. Um, and I'll just look generally to see if it's a good brand fit. So to me, the first thing that you need to decide is, is this person a good fit for my brand and for my brand message? If they're not, then I would just stop looking there. It doesn't matter how many followers they have or anything like that. If they don't fit your brand, to me, that's a deal breaker. And I just stop there and I would decide not to work with them. Assuming this is a person, I looked at this, I read a few of the posts, and, and they looked like somebody I thought I might want to work with, where I feel like uh, it's going to work well for my brand. First thing I'm going to do is look for a media kit on their website, and uh, perhaps something about how to work with them. Those two things are useful, not only because they're going to provide you with a lot of information that you need, but also because they show that the blogger has reached a certain uh, maturity in their blogging career where they're taking it seriously as a business. 
Um, if a person then lacks these things, it doesn't mean they're necessarily going to be a bad person to work with. But when they do have them, it is an indicator uh, that they're taking this seriously, they're actively pursuing work, and that they're trying to take uh, make this a be professional about it generally. So it's a, it's a good indication if they have those. So for me, I have a work with me page, talks a little bit about who I've worked with in the past and my professional writing background and my personal goals as a blogger, lists of services, a uh, list of awards that I've won and, and blah, blah, blah. You know, a lot of things trying to convince people to work with me. Um, so having that, if a blogger has that, it's good because it also will give you an overview of the ways that they expect to work with brands and might open up some ideas for you. And if you, they are already offering the services that you're looking for, then you already know, okay, this is looking like a better fit. Uh, second part is going to be a media kit. Um, a lot of people will have a downloadable PDF format media kit, which I also have, but I like to have one live on my site because I can uh, then feed into it different analytics, like my Google Analytics is uh, constantly updated in real time, so I don't have to actually update this page ever. It's always getting fed constant information about uh, my tr web traffic, where the traffic's coming from, the sources, uh, the follower counts for my different uh, social media accounts. Oh wow, I need to fix the Instagram one there. Something seems to have broken. Um, but generally speaking, it's it's always up to date. So uh, if somebody has a media kit, that's also going to provide you with a lot of good information so that you can drill down a little more and see in more detail how well they fit your brand. So that after the brand fit, and uh, recognizing that a person seems as though they're going to be professional because they have a work with me page. They've probably listed a lot of the companies they've worked with, which I, uh, I have down here, a list of just sample of some of the companies I've worked with. Uh, if they have those things, you feel they're a good fit. They seem relatively professional. Uh, a media kit should include information about some of the past work that they've done, uh, hopefully some of the results that they've gotten for their clients, and it also should show you their traffic. Usually somebody would actually just have a screenshot of their Google Analytics from the past few months that shows uh, how many visitors they got, how many page views they got. Um, they, all bloggers should be transparent about that. And that's something you should not feel shy about asking for. If a blogger doesn't provide their um, Google Analytics up front, to me that would be a bit of a red flag that they have something they're trying to hide because it's a very common practice to share that information. Um, and or it would just indicate to me that they don't understand why that's important, which would make me question how professional they are in other aspects of the job. Uh, so Google Analytics should almost always be within the press kit so you can see how many visitors per month they're getting. It's not an amazing uh, metric actually for measuring the value you'll get from them, but it's a good gauge. So here I have mine listed. I also list which countries it's coming from. You see my the majority of my traffic is coming from the United States, a lot from Canada, and after that Australia and UK. So if you're looking for somebody who's getting these specific people in these countries, then again, that reinforces the idea that, okay, I'm a good fit for your company. If you're looking for somebody who's getting uh, readers from Germany, Italy, uh, Dubai, wherever, something like that, then again, I'm, I'm not going to be the right person. Uh, the next thing you're going to want to look at is demographics, which the ones that I show here are provided by a company called Quantcast, but Google Analytics will also provide bloggers with a lot of this information. So we can drill down even farther to see if this is going to be an audience that is right for you. Mine is majorly 18 to 44. That's the majority of the people reading my website. Um, a lot of them 
have no children, uh, they tend to have a higher income bracket, they tend to be educated. So it gives you an idea of who is reading it. Also, um, I like this about Quantcast. It shows what other people are reading before or after they read my site um, and how much overlap there is. So they're reading things like Outside Magazine. Uh, Fedors, Matador Network, Expert Vagabond, National Geographic, all things that are very closely related to adventure travel, which is my niche. So now you've got a picture of my website as we have uh, educated, uh, white collar working, uh, fairly high earning people that are between uh, 18 and 44, almost like a millennial group. So that tells us a lot about the audience that I have. And that should all be contained in a person's media kit if they send it to you. If they don't have that information in their media kit, you should not feel uncomfortable asking for it. That is very important to choosing the right influencer. And if the person doesn't appreciate your need to make sure they're a good fit, then I would question whether or not I want to work with them on a professional basis because they're not providing the information that you need to make an informed choice. Uh, so these are the things I look for generally when I'm vetting an influencer. If you want to go a little bit deeper, or say let's pretend that this I didn't have a media kit or a work with me page but you still want to vet me. This is how you can do it. Uh, the first thing you do is you come to your website, you'll find the website, take a look for the brand fit, Second thing is you can just hop into the blog or go and look at uh, go and look at a blog post or or two. So once you get onto a blog post, you know, and you're reading about them, you'll find they'll have links to all of their different social profiles. So you can just I would just open each one of these up in a different tab, uh, considering that information hasn't been gathered for me in a media kit. So I'm just going to take a quick look over at their social profiles. Uh, I'm going to look at their Facebook page. How often is it updated? I tend to update mine more or less daily. You can look at the amount of reach that they're getting or how many likes they're getting on average. Um, I wouldn't expect the people to be getting a lot of engagement on their Facebook pages these days. There are some notable exceptions, but for the most part, Facebook it has reduced the reach of pages to a degree where it's very difficult for a person to get good reach on their page organically. Um, but I'd make sure that they're you know, keeping it up and doing a good job with it. Uh, next, you can go and look at their Twitter profile. Just check out how many followers they have. Look at Take a quick look at how much engagement there is, how much conversation is going on, uh, what kind of content they're posting. And the one thing I like to do with this is I just like to check out uh, the fake follower check from Status People. It's here at fakers.statuspeople.com. So what it'll do is uh, it'll use an algorithm to approximate how many fake followers a person might have on Twitter. Now most people you'll find will have some just because fake followers will follow people randomly. So most everyone will have some fake followers. Um, but what you want to be a, keep an eye out for is people who have a very hard, high percentage of fake followers which means they've probably purchased followers in the past. So this is mine. I have 6% fake, 34% inactive, meaning they're just people who don't really use Twitter that much that followed me at some point, and 60% good followers. Again, just like any social account, you can go look at their Pinterest, see how many followers they have, how many likes they have, how active they are, if Pinterest is an important thing to you, and generally just see that it, if it looks like they're doing a good job and people are engaging with them on that platform. Same thing I would look at Instagram. Since Instagram is so important these days, uh, what I would do is I would take a look at their feed, and then I'd start to try and get a feel for what's an average post getting in terms of likes around here. 
So when I look at mine, this one's today's, so it might not have actually peaked in its like. So I'll start. I have 200 here, 140, 133, 92, 164, 133. So out of that, I'm going to approximate. Maybe I should expect to get about 150 likes per photo, just as an approximation. Uh, so I will take the total follower count. Four, 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 three, and I would divide it by 150. Oh wait, sorry, that was backwards. 150 divided by four, 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 three, and you'll see that I'm getting a 3.37, 3.4% engagement rate. That's a really good, fast way to look and see if somebody's getting really poor engagement on Instagram or overly good in engagement on Instagram. From my personal experience, around 2 to 5% is going to be a fairly high to low range of engagement. If someone's getting below 2% engagement on Instagram, you're either they're either going to be putting up content that's probably not resonating with their community, or they may have purchased a large number of fake followers that don't actually like things that they've posted. Um, so that would make me wary. If anyone goes over 5%, I mean, they could be amazing. If the account's amazing, I would consider that maybe it's just a great account. But generally, if it's going to go over 5 or 6%, then I would start to be suspicious that people are paying uh, bots to come onto Instagram and like their things. So that's a quick check you can do to see, do they fall within the relative norm of what happens on Instagram? Uh, of course, there are always going to be outliers and exceptions to the rules, but you can check to make sure they're falling into what would generally be the norm. Uh, next, what I do is if they haven't provided their traffic, or if I haven't spoken to them yet, but I want to see their traffic, I go to this site, similarweb.com, I type in the website name, and it's going to give me a fairly accurate estimate of their traffic. It's not going to be perfect, um, but it should be fairly accurate, if not a little bit low. Okay, so it'll, it'll estimate their traffic for you. One of the nice things it also does is it will tell you their audience interests. Uh, take this with a grain of salt. It's not necessarily going to be the most accurate. For mine, I don't feel like it's very accurate, but it's another another piece of information you can add to your uh, you can add to your research <clears throat> and last you might want to take a look at the open site explorer all this basically is is an algorithm that determines the authority of a website based on what other websites on the internet have a link to it so I have a domain of authority of 43 um, if a person is over 20, you could say that they've probably been working on their blog or their website for a little while, uh, and they're probably doing a pretty good job. If they have an authority of over 30, you could say that they've been going at it for a while, they've been consistent, uh, they're probably working pretty hard, and they could have very high traffic. They could potentially have much more traffic than me with, with a lower domain authority. Um, because this is based on the volume of links coming in from the internet. Once you get up into the 40s, uh, you're talking about some substantially professional bloggers, uh, and in the 50s, you're talking about people who are doing really well. This is nice because it's an indicator partially of um, the attention other websites online have given to them in the term of in the form of links, and so they're the way they are viewed by the internet as a whole. And it also is a good indicator of um, sort of like age, age and effort that's been put into the blog. Again, it's, it's not a perfect indicator at all. It's just another thing that we can look at to see, uh, is this website good? Is it legit? Has it been around a while? And if somebody has a domain of 40 or 50, you can be quite sure they've been around for a while and they've also been doing something right. So those are the things that I would look at uh, vetting a blog without any, if I had no media kit, if I had no press kit, if I had nothing else. 
Uh, the last thing that you should consider is uh, the Professional Travel Bloggers Association. Because we have made this really, really easy. Um, you can just search our members. And rather than going through all those steps and looking at all that stuff and reading through the media kits, like we can search by blogger name here and search for me. And it's going to come up with my profile. My profile has my Google Analytics for 30 days. It shows you right here where my traffic's coming from. It has my follower counts. Again, um, like all follower counts, the API sometimes is behind in updating, so sometimes they're a little bit lower than uh, they truly are. So this gives you all that information condensed into one place. It's mainly a time saver. Uh, and this is what you will see if you have a free membership with the PTBA. You don't have to pay anything for that. Um, you can also say search for bloggers by... Uh, something else such as say you wanted to look at them by their niche because you were looking for a specific food blogger say so let's see what we have up here for food bloggers so you can search by niche you come up with a list of food bloggers uh, you can also filter that down again based on other criteria and then based on that you're again you're getting this list now this is what you'll get if you use the free membership. The paid membership, which is $300 a year, you have the ability to say, look through here and select a bunch of bloggers you want to work with. Then you run down to the bottom of the list, and all those bloggers you checked off, you can just contact them all, you can write a subject, send them a message, and get in touch about your project. Alternatively, you can also dig deeper to learn more about the blogger by clicking on the show more. Uh, which will give you a lot more information on their profile and then you can dig even deeper by going to the blogger's full full profile where you're going to find everything you've got their page views visitors uh, all this sort of stuff you have their email address you have their about uh, two different degrees of bloggers have filled this out to different uh, varying degrees of specificity it'll show you where they're located where they plan travel, uh, all of their social network followers in one place. So I mean as far as the options we have this is going to be the easiest and fastest. The only limiting factor is that it is limited to our members and uh, our members are only allowed in once they've reached a certain level of uh, blogging and uh, influencer experience. So you won't be reaching all the bloggers or all the travel influencers out there, but only the ones that uh, have applied and paid to become members and who have also met our criteria for membership. So uh, that's about it for how we would look at vetting bloggers. Uh, there's three different ways, and uh, none of them are too time-consuming, but as always, I'd say it's if you have the ability or the budget um, I would always recommend just outsourcing it to somebody who does it for a living because they're going to be able to do it much faster and uh, probably more effectively than somebody in-house who has limited time and limited resources. Okay, so uh, we have gotten through what is an influencer, why is influencer marketing important. Um, the main problem with uh, outreach for hotels and tour companies is that they're usually passive in the outreach process, which uh, we talked about fixing, and also how to vet bloggers or influencers to make sure that they're going to be a good fit for you. Um, so that being said, we're going to move on to now a knowledge of industry standards. Um, this is another major pain point for the same reason that vetting abilities are difficult when you have a marketing, marketing team with limited resources. That problem is that the industry standards are changing from day to day. Um, there's constant conversations going on between marketers and between bloggers and between influencers about prices and about deliverables and about uh, 
what is acceptable, what are acceptable rates of pay and pay scales. Um, so it really takes somebody who is immersed in that world to have a solid grasp of the industry, uh, the industry best practices and the industry standards. So again, um, I always recommend outsourcing this sort of thing or hiring a consultant to help guide you with it uh, because it does require sort of an in-depth understanding. Uh, but that being said, the best practices as of now, there's a few I can run through for you that, I mean, there's nothing that's set in stone. You'll find lots of people who agree with what I'm about to say. You'll find lots of people who disagree with what I'm about to say. Um, but there are some generally accepted uh, industry standards. For a hotel, um, I think that most influencers would not accept less than a two-night stay, but I would recommend providing a three-night stay uh, when you are working with them. It gives them a better opportunity to spend time getting to know your property. Uh, it gives them a better opportunity to create content. And more importantly, um, they're just not going to stay for any less time because nobody has time to check into a hotel at 11 a.m. and or at 2 p.m. and then check out the next morning at 11 a.m. and still have time to produce good content and really care about it and put in any effort. So sort of as a best practice for hotels, I would recommend a minimum of two, preferably more nights uh, stay. Often, hotels will ask for bloggers to review them. Unless that's something the blogger specifically does, I think that that's a bad idea. Um, because if it's not something the blogger feels that their audience will be interested in, they're not likely to promote it or put it in a place where their audience is going to find it because they'll feel it's uh, low-value content. And you would, read, you would probably receive a lot more value if you ask that blogger to mention your hotel and mention their stay and maybe include a picture from your hotel in a blog post, a bigger blog post about their experience in your city. Um, that's probably going to get a lot better attention. It's a much more natural way to go about it. And it's something that you'll find that a blogger or influencer will be more comfortable doing as well. Now, in the case that you're working with an influencer, who is just working on uh, the basis of social media coverage, the influencer should already have an idea of how they cover hotels, and that shouldn't be a problem. Uh, one of the second best practices that I would like to um, really stress, <clears throat> I can't stress this enough, if you're going to work with an influencer uh, and they have a good enough audience that they're worthwhile for you to work with, you vetted them, please just pay them. Uh, you have to pay them. Well, you don't have to. Some people will offer to do things for free, but it's really strongly advisable <clears throat> that you pay them. And here are the reasons why. First, you probably want to be working with professionals. We're talking about your company's reputation. You don't want somebody who's sort of okay at what they do handling your company's reputation publicly. You wouldn't want your PR person working for free. Uh, you wouldn't ask your front desk people who are representing your company to your customers. You wouldn't want people there working for free because then you have no control over the quality and you have no uh, no way to encourage uh, certain types of quality or or influence in that way. So that's really important. Um, the second thing is that as soon as you are paying, even if it's a small amount, you have the ability to set specific deliverables and you have the ability to set deadlines and guidelines. Now that's not to say that you can tell an influencer what they should publish. Um, but you can have a set of deliverables in that they will publish a certain amount of content. Now, uh, most influencers, this is another best practice, you should allow an influencer to have 100% editorial control over what they choose to publish. The reason is that 
you're hiring this person because they are an expert in reaching their audience. It doesn't make any sense for you to try and tell them what they should be giving to their audience that's going to resonate with their audience. You need to trust that influencer to display your product or your service or your company in a favorable way to their audience because they know their audience the best. Um, so that being said, coming back to the payment part, if you pay, you can first, if you're not paying, generally some people will try to do this, and I don't consider this to be a best practice or a good standard. Some people will say, if we give you a free stay at our hotel, or we bring you on a free press trip, we are going to demand X, Y, and Z deliverables and want, want you to sign the contract. I personally don't believe in that. Uh, I think that's a terrible way to do business. I come from a traditional press background. Uh, press trips have never ever had a guarantee of coverage attached to them. And if you're not paying somebody for their time and their work, I don't think you have the ability to demand them to provide anything at all. You're giving them that uh, experience based on the idea that you're going to make it so good they'll want to share it with other people. If you're not comfortable with that, then you should pay to get, get that guarantee that they are going to share it with their audience. So that being said, payment enables you to set deliverables, enables you to set deadlines. Um, you may be able to include a few guidelines um, or at least engage with that influencer in a discussion about the things you'd rather highlight, uh, the things you don't need to highlight. And overall, just create a much more effective campaign. For whatever the investment you pay to uh, pay the influencer, the improvement in results is going to be so much more than worth it. So I can't say that enough. Pay them even if it's a small, small stipend. As soon as there's money on the table, you have a lot more control over what happens. Uh, you have something to hold back if that influencer isn't going to deliver. And it puts you in sort of a, a, a better bargaining position when it comes to discussing content and, and delivery and things. Um, other best industry practices and standards. Oh yes, one more that I really want to add. <clears throat> when you're working with influencers, you can pay them to write about your uh, property or your tour or your destination. You can pay them for their influence, yes. But what you'll find is that a lot of these influencers also provide other services. And that if you purchase these other services from them, they will end up writing about your destination or your product uh, just because it's something that they did. And you'll end up finding your stuff on social media. So for example, um, I know there are several photographers out there who are also very well-known travel bloggers, and their main source of income is not um, writing about destinations and having the destination pay them. It's generally that the destination will bring them out there. They'll have a budget to bring this person out uh, because they're an influencer. They'll get to see the place. Uh, but their main source of income is actually just being a photographer and selling their photos to the destination for that destination's collateral for their uh, for their press center uh, so that they have more content for their social feeds. And that's a really common thing to do. And when you put those two things together, you are going to find that you're getting a much better value when you're purchasing the photos as well as uh, the blog post or the Instagram coverage or whatever it is that you're getting. When you combine those services, you'll find that the influencers are just giving you really good deals compared to if you were off hiring a local professional photographer for $1,000 a day. Um, and that also works with video. If you need B-roll or if you want an edit video of your property used for marketing purposes, uh, those sorts of things. If you need social media training for your staff or would like somebody just to come in and help your staff improve their social media uh, abilities, their communication abilities, or you'd like someone to audit your social media accounts to give you recommendations on how you can improve. Um, these are all services that are very commonly provided by travel influencers. And once you start bundling these services together, the prices get very economical for you. Uh, 
You start uh, not having to worry just about your promotions budget. You have a budget for buying media collateral. You have a budget for training. So these are ways that you can make working with influencers even more economical than they already are. And I really strongly recommend it. Uh, this is also a strategy that we at the PTB are recommending influencers take so that at the end of the day, uh, our clients, who are people like you, aren't just walking away with a very abstract idea of I got some coverage on a blog and I got some pictures of my hotel on Instagram, but that you also own something at the end of the day that you can take away and that you can use into, into, uh, in the future to market your company. So I really consider that to be one of, one of the better practices to follow as well. Uh, so those are some of the general industry standards. Um, if you're interested in keeping up on them, I really recommend signing up for one of the PTBA memberships, even if it's the free one, so that you can stay in touch with us on the blog and find out how these things are evolving over time. Next, uh, follow through. This is one last problem that a lot of companies have, uh, but it's pretty easy to address, is that if you are the company that I originally was talking about, you're the hotel or the tour company that's been waiting, a blogger sent you an email, said, hey, I'm in your town and I'd like to uh, come stay at your property. I will you know, blog about it or I'll Instagram about it or whatever. Um, and so they do. What you have is a situation where you have a very, uh, a very weak social contract between the two of you. Because you don't know that person, you don't know the influencer, you have a very weak relationship, they're going to be there for two days and then they're going to leave again. Um, and you have no way to enforce them uh, following through with whatever their promise was. Now most of the time I'm sure that they will follow through. Um, at least, you know, say our most of our PTBA members I would say are very likely to. It depends on the bloggers who you choose. Um, but you don't have any way to enforce or be sure that they're going to follow through. So the two ways to do that are, uh, one is to, again, like I've said many times, outsource to somebody who does this on a regular basis because that person is knows most of the influencers around and most of the influencers around will know that person if they work for a fairly well-known PR company or one of the few little boutique companies that specialize in this kind of influencer outreach. Um, they're especially well-known in the community. In that case, if a person bails on a random PR person at a hotel and doesn't deliver, uh, it's really not probably going to cause a huge problem for their reputation. If an influencer bails out on a company that specializes in influencer marketing, then their reputation has a serious problem, not only with that company, but then within the community because everyone talks about these things. Uh, so that's one thing you can do in order to uh, ensure delivery. And the other thing you can do is, again, I mean, it just it's simple, just pay them. Um, offer them some sort of a stipend or some payment on delivery. And then if they don't deliver, you don't have to pay them. And it's as simple as that. So again, it does come back to paying is really going to, it's going to relieve a lot of headaches. It's going to save a lot of time in a lot of ways. Um, and it's going to increase the quality of the product delivered to such a degree that it's um, almost like a waste of your effort not to put all this effort into working with influencers and then not pay them to get that extra uh, to get that extra boost in quality and boost in effort from them and boost in dedication from them and that extra control over the conversation. It really doesn't make sense to go through all that trouble and then not add a little, it's not a large amount of money a lot of the times that you have to add on top of it. It just doesn't make sense not to do it. Uh, so those are the main pain points that I wanted to uh, speak about. I'm going to check my notes here. Is there anything else? There is nothing else. So uh, I hope that you found this helpful. This was meant to be just sort of a primer on how you can next get started working with bloggers. Um,
again, I highly recommend that you take a look at signing up for the freemium membership for the PTBA, looking through our database to see if there's anybody you want to work with. Uh, we also, with our premium memberships, we have a Facebook group where you can ask questions and uh, get responses from our senior bloggers about uh, what you can do to address your specific problems or your next steps when you're trying to work with influencers. And I'd like to thank the Pacific Asia Travel Association for helping us to reach out to all of you guys. I really hope that we see you in Indonesia in September because it's going to be a great conference. And we're going to have, you know, 15 or 20 bloggers there who are eager to meet you as well. So thanks very much for attending.